going to invite you to open your Bible to Colossians chapter 1, please. We're going to look at verses 15 to 20. There's Pew Bibles or your own Bible or maybe a Bible app. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. I'll read it and then we'll pray and look at these wonderful words about our Lord Jesus. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Colossa. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this night in the midst of storms. For some of us, the storms we face might be light winds. For some of us, it might be hurricanes. For some of us, it might mean like that the storms and trials of life are, are never ceasing and unending. We go from one thing to another. And in the midst of those storms, Father, you know that our hearts seek all kinds of anchors, all kinds of things to hold on to or things that we run to and put our confidence in in the midst of those things. But the reality is, it's your son Jesus we need to go to because he is the rock. He is the anchor that we desperately need in this life. And so we pray that as we meditate on and reflect on these incredible words of Paul about the Lord Jesus, that you would stir our hearts with greater affection for Jesus, that you would give us a clear understanding and grasp of who he is and what he has done and what he can do, and that you would strengthen his grip on us and that we would hold fast to him. And so we pray that you would give us joy as we read about and talk about and think about him, our blessed King Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. I want to start by asking you a question, which is what I usually do. <laughs> and it's this, what is your anchor in life? I talked in my prayers about storms that you face when things get tough What's your anchor? What's your cornerstone? What are the things or, or the people that you go to to kind of hang on to when life gets rough? What's your anchor? The Oxford English Dictionary defines an anchor as a source of confidence or security. So what is your source of confidence? Or what is your source of security? Or maybe it's who is your source of security. Another word for anchor is cornerstone. What's your cornerstone in life? Recently, uh, when it was Mother's Day, uh, I was in the store, like many others, looking for a Mother's Day card. And there were so many beautiful cards to choose from to express our gratitude to our wonderful mothers. And I noticed that many of them that I were looking to said something along the lines that, Mom, you're like an anchor in the home. Our mom, you were always there for me no matter what happened, or you always are. You're, you're just like this rock in the home. And this is often true, and we're thankful for that. But I started thinking as I read those cards, well, where does mom get that strength from to be that rock anyways? What's the source of that for her? How does she do it? And then what happens when mom passes on? Or what happens when we move out into the world out of her nurture in the home and we face the storms that life will bring to us all? What then? 
What will be your confidence of, uh, uh, sorry, your source for confidence and security? I ask this because I think that's the thing that Paul is driving at when he writes these incredible verses about Jesus to a church in Colossa that was experiencing different storms and trial. And he wants to help them back then, and he wants to help us tonight to have a her firm grasp and grip on who Jesus is and what he can do so that he becomes your anchor. And you're only one. Because he's the only one who can do the things that we all desperately need. This cosmic Christ. So let's set this in context. How do we get here anyways? Paul's concern in this letter is that this young church in Colossa would grow in Christian maturity. He wants them to be mature, spirit-filled Christians. How do you know this? We know this from the way the letter begins and it ends. So look at the beginning. In verses 9 to 11 of chapter 1, Paul talks about his unceasing prayer for the Christians in Colossa. And he says this, We haven't ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. An incredible prayer to pray. And in a word, what Paul is praying for is you'll be mature. So you'll have mature understanding from God's word that will live to a mature way of life, of walking in a manner of the gospel. And you'll be someone who has endurance in life. Not from yourselves, but being strengthened by God's power. Do you see that? So it's a prayer for maturity. Now keep a body part there and look to chapter 4. And in verse 12, Paul talks about Epaphras, who's one of them. And he says, here's Epaphras' prayer. He's always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the wisdom of God. So when you are mature in Christ, you will stand assured. When you are mature in Christ, He will be your anchor. When you're mature in Christ, He will be your source of power, endurance, confidence, and security. In other words, He'll be your anchor. That's what happens when you're a mature Christian. You'll ultimately look to Jesus and trust in Him and have your confidence in Him. Someone recently asked me, Sean, do you get nervous before you preach? I said, no, I don't. And I said to the person who asked me, in case you think I'm cocky or self-confident, let me explain myself. I'm not nervous because I'm self-confident. I'm not nervous because I've been doing this for a long time or I'm educated at a certain seminary or I think I can speak well. No. I'm confident before you and I'm not nervous when I come up because I'm confident in Jesus. I know that he's seated at the right hand of the Father watching and listening right now. And he's among us by his Spirit. And I'm confident that this is his word. So I don't have to make up stuff and try to sound eloquent and fun to you. I show you him and teach you what he says. And because of that, I can stand before you confident. Does that make sense? It's not about me. It's because of him and what he says. And that's the mature way. To have a confidence in Jesus and his word. And that's what Paul is praying for them. That's what Epaphras is praying. And that's why Paul writes this letter. So that they and all churches who read this will be mature in Christ Jesus. Why is this Paul's concern with the church in Colossa? In chapter 2, verse 1, he tells us, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, that was another church down the road in Lycus Valley, 
and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, there's maturity again, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he says, I say this, here's why, because I don't want anyone to delude you with plausible arguments. There's the storm. Plausible arguments. There are always people inside and outside the church with plausible arguments that can pull us away of having our confidence in Christ and his word. And that's why Paul's writing this letter to the church. It's why he prays for them. It's why Epaphras prays for them. And now it's why he writes the passage that's before us. He gives three warnings in chapter 2. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive. He says, see to it that no one passes judgment on you. And then he says, see to it that no one disqualifies you. So how do you do that? How do you make sure that you're not captive, taken captive by teaching that's not based on God's word? But it sounds good. It sounds plausible. How do you make sure that other people don't pass judgment on you for your freedom and faith and confidence in Christ Jesus? How do you make sure that no one can disqualify you? How do you stand firm? Paul says so in chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, the big idea of the book. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. It's Jesus again. Walk in Him. So receive Him through repentance and faith, and then walk in Him. And what happens when you walk in Jesus? Verse 7, chapter 2, Paul says you'll be rooted in him, so there's your foundation, right? And then you'll be built up in him, so you'll grow. And then what? You'll be established in the faith. There it is again, mature. So it starts with Jesus receiving him. It continues with Jesus being rooted in him like a tree. It continues in Jesus being built up and growing in him. And it continues in Jesus when you are a mature Christian and you're established in him. He's the rock you stand on. And no matter what comes in life, you'll stand in the end. Not because of yourself, not because of the anchors you look for, but because of Jesus. He's the rock. He is the anchor stone. So that's why Paul writes what he's about to look at. We're look at now in chapter 1 verses 15 to 20. If you get hold of and understand who Jesus really is, he'll be your rock. You'll become mature. And you'll toss all the other so-called anchors out of your boat and you'll look to him alone. And you'll have confidence, no matter what life brings, because you are rooted in him, growing in him, and established in him. Paul says two amazing things that encapsulate all the things he's saying in these verses, which frankly, I mean, you could write a book on, couldn't you? And the first one is this, it's simple. Verses 15 to 19, Paul is showing the church in Colossa and us tonight that Christ is the cosmic ruler. Christ is the cosmic ruler. Look at what he says, verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That points to the incarnation the power and glory of Almighty God Himself has been manifested in the incarnation, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, His Son. And that's why John in his Gospel says, no one has ever seen God. You can't. You'll die. He's so holy. But 
Jesus has made him known. And it's why Jesus says to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's a bold claim. He is Almighty God himself in the flesh. And it's why the author of Hebrews says Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus shines and radiates the Shekinah glory of God. And it's this Jesus that Paul says is the firstborn of all creation. And you go, hang on a second. Now, how can he be firstborn? Because if he's God, that means God's eternal and God wasn't born. So what does it mean that he's the firstborn of all creation? It means this. In Hebrew culture, to be the firstborn means you're the heir of everything. There wasn't the split up wills there are these days. It was different back then. If you're the firstborn, you got everything. And so to say that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation is to say that Jesus is the heir of everything. And we know that because Paul says to the church in Corinth, God has subjected everything under his son. And it means that Jesus can look at the continents, the oceans, the galaxies, the solar systems, the planets, the black holes, and he can say, it's all mine. All of it. The Father's given all of it to me. It's why he says at the end of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's the heir of everything. It doesn't mean he's been created because verses 16 and 17 go on to say he exists before all things. It means that everything exists for Jesus. And without him, there's nothing. And we're going to see that in a moment. Because, the very next verse, 16, because, or for, by Jesus, all things were created. And so Paul is saying in Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? Paul says, through Jesus. By Jesus, for Jesus. He was there. Everything exists because of Him. It means that Jesus is the substance and foundation of all things. And that means His reign is comprehensive and complete. It's why he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, like we sang earlier. Because he's absolutely supreme and sovereign. He has to be. Because everything doesn't exist without him. It can't. Everything is made by him, through him, and for him. Do you see that? And because of that, Paul says... Because everything is created by him, whether things in heaven and on earth, visible thrones and dominions or rulers and authorities, all these things created through him and for him, and therefore he's before all things. He's preexistent because he was there in the beginning. And therefore, what? Verse 17. In Jesus, all things hold together. That's why Jesus is my anchor. That's why I'm confident in Him. Because He made me and He holds me together. And I need that because life's been rough <laughs> the last number of years for me, to put it lightly. But Jesus has held me together. Maybe you'll go through a bit of a rough time while you wait for your pastor. I know you're anxious for a new pastor. I don't know what God has in store for you, but Jesus will hold you church together. He's the glue. So that's why he's your anchor, because he holds things together. 
And he can hold everything together because he made everything. And he's the heir of it all. And he's the king of it all. And he's the ruler of it all. He's the Lord of it all. So it makes perfect logical sense, does it? He can hold it all together. And so he can hold your marriage together. He can hold your family together. He can hold the cells of your bodies together, which is why we pray for those who are sick. He can hold the church together. Again, it's like we sang. I didn't have this. I didn't know you were going to sing this tonight. It's perfect. He really does have the whole world in his hands. That little nursery song is true. He does. So Jesus is the cosmic ruler of all creation. He is superior, he is supreme, he's the author of life, and he's the sustainer of life. He holds all things together. And because he is the ruler of all things, he is also, verse 18, the head of the body, the church. Now, I want you to stop and think about how Paul says this. He doesn't say the head of the church first. He says the head of the body. And so it means that the church is a living organism, just like your physical body is. And just like our physical bodies have a head that controls the body and nourishes the body, Jesus is the head of us, which means what? He considers us his body. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Because what that says to me is, Jesus doesn't want to live without us. I can't live without my body. I don't want to live without my body. I want to try to. Jesus chooses to be connected to us. Like his own body. Do you see that? He chooses to be identified with us. He chooses to be one with us. He chooses us to be part of Him. He doesn't want to be separated from us. And I think the most beautiful thing of all is (laughs) He's not ashamed of us. He loves us. He delights in us. We're his. It's like that old hymn, my beloved is mine and I am his. That's why we're called his bride. He adores us the way a groom adores his bride on the wedding day. We're his body. And therefore, we need him to nourish us. Just as the body can't live without the head, the church cannot live and exist without Jesus. He's the shepherd we need. And Paul goes on to say this Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That's the resurrection. The chains of death couldn't hold him. He defeated death. Now link that to the verse before it. What does it mean? It means that if the head is resurrected, what happens to the body? It gets resurrected too. And because we are Christ's body, when we die, he will raise us. And the same power that raised him on the third day is the same power that will raise you and me. We share in his resurrection. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's not the only born from the dead. He's the first of many. And it's why John Donne, in his holy son and on death, said, death has died. It's why it means for us, death is a comma, not a period. We fall asleep and we wake again with him. And it's this Jesus 
that is, verse 18, preeminent. He's the firstborn of a new humanity which is to be glorified as the Lord Jesus has been glorified. We will share in his exaltation, we'll share in his glory, we'll share in his resurrection, we'll share in the new life to come if we are part of his body and connected to him through faith. So do you see what Paul's doing here? He's making a connection between Christ as creator and Christ as redeemer. And in Jesus, those two things intersect and come together. More on that in a moment. But he's saying the material realms that Jesus created and the spiritual realms are all brought under his sovereign dominion. That's why Paul says whether it's things in heaven, the heavenly bodies, or things on earth, the physical realities. He says everything has been brought under him. Visible, invisible, heaven, earth, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things are created through him and for him. Do you see that? He is the supreme cosmic ruler. Notice how many times Paul says all. Verse 15, all creation. Verse 16, by him, all things were created. Verse 16, all things were created through him and for him. Verse 17, he's before all things. Verse 17, in him, all things hold together. Verse 19, in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things. These verses are devastating in their comprehensiveness. And so the question is this, is Jesus adequate? Is he enough for you? Yes. Why do we look elsewhere? Why do we look at things and our resources? Why do we do that? Let's get our heads around this, who he is. He's adequate, he's sufficient. And if you're still not convinced, look at verse 19. All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. Wrap your head around that. The God of the universe, who is infinite, who is majestic in glory, who no human eye has ever seen. The immortal, invisible, God only wise that we sang about. He dwelled in his fullness in Jesus. Jesus reflects the glory of Almighty God who upholds the world and the universe by his power. And that means, church, Jesus is the anchor we need. He's the only one because he is immovable. He is unstoppable. And his love for us is unfailing. Do you know that? Not even your sins can separate you from him. You understand that. If you're in Christ, they're all forgiven. Even the sins I'll commit tonight and tomorrow and next week and next month and next year, not even those can separate his love from us. So he's the anchor. And it's this Jesus, this cosmic ruler, the one in whom the fullness and glory of God dwells, who was born in the muck who laid in a manger made of straw, born amongst the poor in rags, coming into the broken world that Adam left behind to become one of us and to redeem and make new and beautiful every part of us. This glorious, exalted Jesus is not ashamed to be one of us. He's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. He's not ashamed to say, that's my family and that's my body. And nothing's going to separate me from them and them from me. It's wonderful. So is he adequate? Is he sufficient? It's such a relief, isn't it? To come to the place 
where you can say, boy, life has taught me I really don't have it all together. But that's okay because Jesus does. And he's got me in his hands. When you come face to face with this Jesus and believe in him and trust him, then you will be rooted. Then you will grow. And then you will be established. Mark my words, there is no one else and there's no other way but him. And don't let anyone convince you otherwise. Let's pause and consider again this for a moment. Jesus has it all. And he lays it all aside to reconcile us. To make us his own. And that leads to the second point. Christ the cosmic ruler is also Christ the cosmic reconciler. Verses 19 to 20. Paul says, In Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So why did the cosmic ruler become one of us? So he could reconcile us to God the Father, giving us the peace that we come into this world looking for. Why do we need to be reconciled? Look at the very next verse, 21. You were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. This is the truth of every single being born on this planet. By nature, we are not friends with God. We're alienated from him. By nature, all of us are hostile in mind towards God. And by nature, all of us have done and do evil deeds. So we're not born at peace with God. We're born at enmity with God. And we need to be reconciled. And that's why Christ the cosmic ruler was hung on a tree like a criminal. Because we needed to be reconciled. And we weren't interested in being reconciled because we're hostile and alienated. But God loved us anyway and reached through the cross and reconciled us to himself. This is the heart of the human problem. It's why there's not peace in people's hearts. But we're all looking for peace. We want to be okay on the inside. We want to be okay on the outside. We want to feel regulated. But we run to so many things looking for that. But they'll never give us the peace we're looking for. Because we're made for God. And so God sends His Son... And verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Notice the force. Where's the emphasis? Where's the action? It's all on God's side. This is us, alienated, hostile, doing evil, in the darkness, don't want the light shining on us, want nothing to do with God. And it's God who sends his son. It's Jesus who dies. It's God who does the reconciling and brings us to himself so that we can have peace by the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. Would you like to feel at peace? Would you like your burdens to be lifted? Would you like to be forgiven? Look no further. He's the one. You see, our confidence again, it's not what we believe 
about Jesus. Yes, it's right to have good doctrine and all that. Don't get me wrong. But that's not it ultimately. Our confidence is in Him. Jesus is not a subject to be discussed. He is a person to be encountered and known and known by and loved and loved by. That's who He is. And so is He adequate to be your anchor? You've got to ask yourself that question. Is His power sufficient to carry you from conversion to glory? Can He sustain and hold you together from the womb to the tomb? Can He cause you to be rooted? Can He help you grow? Can He establish you in life? Can He cause you to flourish and be confident even when life throws all kinds of wreckage at us? Yes, He can. Because the fullness of God dwells in Him. So what are you waiting for? If you haven't come to Him, what are you waiting for? Or maybe you have, but you're, you're kind of tepidly putting the foot in the water and you've still got one foot in the boat here. I'm not sure about this guy. He's sufficient. He's adequate. And He's for you. He wants you to be part of His body. So lay all of your so-called anchors at His feet and turn to Him and trust in Him because He is fit for the job. For some of us, our anchors, our education, skills, Careers, finances, investments, strength. Maybe it's our family. All of things, those things are fine and good and they're gifts from God, but you know none of them are anchors. Why not? Because none of them are eternal. Your finances aren't eternal. Your family's not eternal. Your job's not eternal. Your education's not eternal. Your investments are eternal, and our physical strength surely isn't eternal. What then? What then? Or maybe you sit here tonight and you think, I don't have any of those things. Maybe you're sitting here tonight saying, I have no anchor at all. And maybe your life right now is in quiet despair. And you struggle with depression. You're filled with doubt. You don't know why. You feel hopeless and anchorless, tossed around on the sea. Wherever you're at, you and me, all of us, we need Jesus. We need Him. I need Him more than anything. And the older I get and the more I grow in the Lord, the more I realize how desperate I really am and how much I need Him. I am nothing without Him. All that I am and all that I have is because of Him. And it's why Peter in his first sermon on Pentecost says this, Jesus has become the cornerstone and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The first ever Christian sermon, the Apostle Peter said it, Jesus is the anchor. He's the cornerstone and he continues to be. And so... I want to close with one of a verse from one of my favorite hymns that I feel really encapsulates what we just read, and it's this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. And all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, you are more magnificent and majestic than we can possibly imagine. And you truly are the cornerstone. 
and you really do hold all things together. And Jesus, I pray that you would help all of us, including me tonight, to understand how desperate we really are and how you're the one. You're the answer. You're the ruler and you are the reconciler. You are a supreme Lord and you're a sufficient Savior. You're fit for the job. And so where we're at tonight, I pray that you would help us tonight to pray to you and to come to you and to lay everything at our feet and to put all of our confidence and hope in you. And that by your grace, you would respond by rooting us in you, growing us in you, and establishing us in you so that we may stand on that day. And we long for that day to see you, Jesus. Amen.